Unit one, final exam. So some problems to look at the review. The first question I have here, uh, I've given you some data. What kind of model would best describe this data if you could not use a calculator? If this is on the section that was not a calculator, what would you do to figure out what type of model is presented here in this data? You plot it? Okay, what if you could not use a calculator to plot it though? Oh, plot by hand, that's an idea. There's an easy way. All right, find the A rock in here. So if we started to find the A rock, what would the A rock do? It's an idea. So it's change of Y divided uh, by the change in X. So what's the change here between 5 and 11? We increase by 6. We increase by 6. What's the change in the X? 1. So do I actually need to divide by 1? Do I need to put six over one? Yeah. Well, what do y'all think? More people, I hear like three or four voices. They're all correct, by the way. Do I need to put six divided by one? No. no, why not? What is six divided by one? Six. six. So I'm just going to write a six here. So the first value of this A rock is six. Okay, what about the second? 32. Great math. About to see who the mental math champs are here. 43 to 131. Remember, this is without a calculator now. 90. So if it were 90, that would get us to 133. So it's 88, two less. Good job. I think Kevin does his math the same way I do. I first get about what 10 is it almost, and then I figure out the next number. All right, what about here? 131 to 305. 34. What'd you say? So that would be oh, to 200. So, oh. so to get to from 131 to 305, it would be 174. 174. Okay, we got one more here. What about making it all the way from 305 to 595? Okay, whether you recognize it or not, we have just discovered this is not linear. If this data were linear, the first difference, the A rock column, which could be called first difference, would all be constant equal values. A constant that is equal, meaning it'd be like six, 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 six. Is that the case here? No. No, it's not linear. So what do you do now? We do it again. We find the change in A rock. So now we're going to find what's called the second difference. If this was called uh, first difference right here. This was called the first difference. Now I'm going to do it again. And so what will we call it the second time? We will call it the second difference. So this is going to be the change in a rock column here. And this will be the second difference. Uh, there we go. Second difference. So What's the change from 62, excuse me, 16 to 32? 16. I hear 16 and I hear 26. One's correct, one's not. Which 26. one is it? 26. 26? Okay. We're doing mental math, so take your time if you need to. 32 to 88. 52. If it's 30 to 80, that's 50. So 2 to 8 would be 6. So 32 to 88 would be? 45. 56. Okay, what about the next one? Ooh, good math. 80 more gets you to 188, uh, 168, I'm sorry. And you'll still need another six, so 86. Looks good. This one here. 174 to 290. I hear 106, so close. 116. 116 is it. Okay. Is it quadratic? So if the first difference is equal, it's linear. Is the second difference equal? No. Then it's not quadratic either. So now what do we do? We do, we do the change in and the change of a rock, which that's doesn't even really have a name. So this time instead of naming it, I'm just gonna say third difference here. Third difference. 
pin is acting up on me all of a sudden. I don't know what's going on with it. Third difference. Okay, 26 to 56. 30. 56 to 86. 30. 86 to 116. All right, guess what we determined? It's a cube. This is a cubic graph. How wide, how or why is it a cubic graph? It took three differences to get to a constant. So what kind of model would best describe the data? This is a cubic function. That's how you do that without a calculator. Whoops. Well, let me write it in. There we go. It's a cubic function. Because since, since third difference uh, is a constant is a constant other than zero, I should say. Constant other not equal to zero. So meaning, why do I say not equal to zero? You could do one more difference here. What's the difference between 30 and 30? Zero. zero. What's the difference between 30 and 30? Zero. zero. You, you don't go to the zeros. So the first one is constant that's not zero. That's where you stop. So because it's a third difference, that makes it a cubic equation. Questions over that part? Let's look at part number two. It says, what is the group regression? So this is with the calculator. How do we do this the other day? Do you remember? Table. So open up your calculators. Open up your calculators here. And I, I'd encourage everybody to go new document. Don't save, because I'm going to have you do a few different things. This way, we're all cleared. And so when I say later, go type in F1. For you, it'll be F1 as well. So everybody go to home screen, choose a do, new document, and do not save. Now from here, what did you add to start if you have a table? Lists and spreadsheets. Open up a list and spreadsheet. Do not forget to go up and put a title of X and Y. That's all they call this, so I'm going to do X and Y. Do that first. You don't want to forget. It will not calculate it if you don't title the axis up there. Our Xs were from 0 to 5, counting by 1s. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The Y values are 5, 11, 43, 131. 305 and 595. Now, because we already know what type of equation it is, we can choose it from regression from here. What type do we already discover this is? Cubic. Since we already know, we could do it here. If you did not know, we would need to add a scatter plot. I'll do that in a second just to show you. But to remind you from here, how you get a cubic, you press menu. Am I going too fast? Okay, menu. I'll blow it up so you can see better now. Now we got the data in. Choose statistics, stat calculations. And from here are all your choices. Find cubic. It's number seven. For X list, you have to put what you titled your X column, which I titled mine X. And Y list, do the same. I titled mine Y. Now, something that's very important for you is that next line. You need to get in the habit of checking. Now, if, you like, if you're like me all year when I say clear your calculator, yours should say F1. If you ignored what I said, yours will not say F1. You need to pay attention right now and make sure your calculator, whatever it says, that you got what it had, what it saved as. Does everybody see what theirs is saving as? After you do that, you can press Enter, or you go down and press OK, whichever you prefer to do. And it should give you your values here. Now, what was weird is mine gave me crazy decimals, and the class in first period said that they did not get crazy decimals. Are y'all getting crazy decimals or whole numbers? It should be whole numbers. I don't know what's wrong with my version, but it should be whole numbers. This rounds to be what number? Negative two. Negative two. Is that what you have in yours? Yes. Perfect. And you got a three here? All right, great. Here's our equation. 
Uh, if you're like, what is the A, B, C, and D? It is, if you go up a little bit, you can see the equation. The A goes in front of the X cubed, B will go in front of X squared, and so on. So with that, my coefficients are five, negative two, three, five. Five, negative two, five, uh, three, five. What is the regression? We're gonna write in. My regression would be this. Y would equal five X cubes. Was it five, negative two? Yes. Five, so negative two X squared plus three X plus five. five. By the way, how accurate is our model? You would look at the R squared. What is that R squared telling you? It's 100% accurate. Mine's actually saying 0 0.9999999996, but it should be 100% accurate. So you remember that part? Okay, before I move on to the next two questions, let's say for a second, if you had this data first on a calculator session section and you did not know what type of data it was, meaning what type of regression is, uh, this is how you do a scatter plot. One more time, I just want to remind you how to do this, so review. Press control doc. What will happen if you press control and then this doc button? New tab. It'll give you a new tab, a new page. For a, a scatter plot, do y'all remember which one to click? Add data and statistics. Here, when you click on yours, you'll probably have your dots scattered differently than me. They just scatter them kind of randomly as best I know. To make it make sense, you have to add what you want to be the x-axis, what you want to be the y-axis. What did we call our x-axis? X. X. What did we call our y-axis? Y. y. Okay, and so from here, you could look at it, and you could make some observations about what type of graph this is. Uh, we've seen some graphs. Would this be a line? Does the, does the scatter plot resemb resemble a line here? Yeah. No. no, it's not a line. Could it be a parabola, potentially? No. Does it look like at the right side of a parabola? Yes. I would say it could be a parabola if you were just guessing. You would want to check the R squared of a parabola. Could it be a square root? Or that was half of a sideways parabola. Could this be a square root? No, it won't be a square root. So there's a lot of things that it's not. If you take a look back in the back, you see uh, the, in the back right, those two, the, my last two posters that I have drawn. They look like waves. Do you see those in the top right? Mm -hmm. That's called the sine wave and cosine wave. We'll deal a lot with that in unit three. It's not a sine or cosine because this is not a wave. So you could eliminate a lot, but at the end of the day, you'd say, okay, it could be a parabola, it could be a cubic, and it could be exponential. And you just check to see which R squared is the highest. That's what you would do there. So are we cool with that? You remember how to do that part? Can I switch gears and go back? No questions? If you do, it's fine. No questions? All right, let's go. Uh, by the way, you could do the regression from here. Once you're here to try, you press menu, analyze. Let's say you're not sure and you're like, hey, maybe it's a square root. Um, or maybe you say, maybe it's a power. Well, will it do a power? No, it's not a power. So you're like, well, maybe it's a uh, linear. Does that look very good? No. Maybe it's a cubic. Does that look good? There we go. Cubic is much better. Let me see if I can delete that. There we go. So yeah, it's cubic. That's that's just a, a way you can do that from the screen. Okay, so now let's go back over here to my problem. It says, what kind of equation represents a rock? What about the change in a rock? Okay, this is very important that you know this. How did we know the original data was cubic? How do we figure that out? Because it took three differences to get to a constant. Now let's talk about a rock. Here's a rock. What would a rock be? It would be squared. Why do we? How'd you put that together so fast? It goes down. Oh, good. So if you're looking at a rock, how many? Differences does it take from a rock to get to a constant? Two. Two. That means that if the original, let me go down to the bottom and add this in. Well, my pen is not working. Let's use this one. 
That means if this data was cubic, that if you take away a difference, so now we're here, this would be quadratic. Just to make sure everybody catches, why is it quadratic? Because from the red, how many levels does it take to get to the constant? Two. So that would make this quadratic. Its leading term would have an x squared. If this is x cubed, because of three differences it took, this is quadratic. OK, tell me about this one. What would this, the change in a rock, what type of equation would model this? Linear. This would be linear. <laughs> so what, uh, that would be an x. Actually, I can go ahead and give you the equation. This is really easy for me. How much are these changing by every time? This would be the slope. How much is the slope, cha slope changing by every time? 30. I'll give you the whole equation right here. That's 30. And then where are we beginning from? That's the y-intercept. So it'd be 30x plus 26. That would be the linear equation right there. I don't know the quadratic. We found the cubic. It's right there. That would be the cubic equation. Okay, and then this. You would call this. What do you call it if it never changes? I said the word. It's a constant. This is constant. Okay, so let me throw out some potential questions you have. If I told you that the A rock was cubic, if I told you A rock was cubic, what could you tell me about delta A rock? If I told you this is cubic, what could you tell me about this one? That this would be quadratic, okay? What if I said this? And what if I said the A rock is linear? What could you tell me about the original? Quadratic. Are y'all figuring out how, what we're doing? You're either adding a power or taking it away. What if I told you that delta A rock is non-existent, meaning it's all zeros? You don't even have anything there. What would that mean about this one? That this is constant. And if this is constant, what would be the original data? Linear. Linear. Yep. Questions over that part. So uh, this, what kind of equations? would be a rock let's go ahead and fill that in for your notes later makes sense what type of equation would be the a rock column this is a rock right here we said quadratic and what could you tell me about delta a rock that's linear now i'm going to do one more thing before i get to this part okay go to your calculators i'm going to make sure you know how to find this um, press control doc. What's control doc going to do? This time I want you to choose add graph. Now, do you remember a moment ago? Say a moment, probably now five, 10 minutes ago. I said, check what you're saving it as. For me, it was F1. Do you remember me saying that? I want you to press the up arrow and you should see your equation typed in, except yours won't be crazy decimals. I don't know why mine's doing this. Oh, it is? Okay, do you want to just leave it? Nah, let's do it right. What did we say A was? Uh, Five. This was negative two or minus two. This is a positive three. And this is five even. Now, once you have your equation right, Hit enter and it should show, uh, it should graph it. What type of shape should we be expecting if it's cubic? S. S curve. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and press enter. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to show you from the calculator how you can figure out uh, what the equation of A rock would look like and what the equation of delta A rock would look like. So follow along. You need to make sure you have this graph. You have it graphed in? Okay, now press the tab arrow again and it should give you a new equation. I want you to do uh, control divide so that it shows a fraction. Control divide, give yourself a fraction. 
the formula, if you remember, it's y, it's slope. It's y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. We're going to have the calculator do this for us. Here's what I want you to type in. As long as yours says F1, I want you to type in F1 parentheses X plus one. Now what this is gonna do is, for example, if X is zero, what's zero plus one? It's gonna plug in and say, well, it's gonna get the, the first, the Y value when X is one, and we're gonna subtract this by F1 of X. So for example, when X is zero, it's actually gonna say, okay, what's the Y value when X is one? And then what's the Y value when X is zero? And it'll subtract. Now down here, I'm gonna do X plus one minus X. Now truthfully, this should just be the value one when we simplify, but I'm gonna still do it just for good measure. This is the change in Y's divided by the change in X. That's like Y2, Y1, X2, x1 that's what i just typed in so if we're thinking we should know what graph we're going to see here if this was a cubic what should this a rock be not cubic not linear quadratic this one should be quadratic because it should lose a power press enter what do you see did you get a quadratic parabola I'm going to slide my graph over so you can see mine a little better. I'm getting a quadratic parabola. I'm actually going to make mine not be so wide. I'm going to cut down the width a little bit here. Let's go to 6 and negative 4. I'm going to tighten mine up a little bit, and then I'll make it go taller. I'll make it go up to 30 and down to, let's say, negative 20 so you can see it better. Do you see how this is an S-curve? And this is a parabola. So that would represent the A rock. Now, one more time, I want you to press tab. <clears throat> this time, I want to show you how you would do delta A rock. The change in A rock. Do a fraction again. Now I want to know not the change in the original cubic. I want to now know the change in the quadratic. So I'm not going to type in F1 this time. I'm now going to type in F2 because F2 represents a rock. Do F2, X plus 1 minus F2 of X. And the denominator, you put the change in Xs. So that was the change in Ys. We're doing the change in Ys in the a rock column. Now down below, I'm going to do parentheses x plus 1 minus x. Again, this does, if you're doing mental math, that does simplify to be a 1, but I'm going to type it in anyways. Press Enter. Which graph should we see this time? What shape? If this is the change in a rock, we should see a line. Do we have a line? Now, I wish I knew how to change colors, but I don't. Does anybody know how to change colors on, on this calculator? Well, I don't know what I just did, but not sure where to uh, do that. It would be nice if I knew so I'd get a different color for you, but it is what it is. Uh, so now, what do I want to show you with this? Press Control T. That should pull up a table. And I'm going to slide mine over. I don't know if you can do that, but I'm going to show you mine. Okay, so did I give you the table originally? Zero, uh, zero Y is a point, zero five is a point, one eleven, two forty three. Was that matching up? Okay, now I want you to look at what was our value for A rock? Six, Six thirty two, eighty eight. Check this out. Check this out. Go to the next column. What do you see in, in that A rock column? 6, 32, 88, 74. Were those the numbers we were getting? You bet they were. Hey, Kevin. Take it, head on two, please. Go over one more column. We also did delta A rock. What do you see over there? 26, 56, 86. Is that what we had? Yes. Looky there. That's how you do that. 
Now I stopped after Delta A rock. I didn't do the third difference, but that's how uh, you can do all that in the calculator. So uh, what did I type in here? I'm gonna press control T to show you one more time. What I typed in was uh, this right here. That was our A rock. And this was Delta A rock. That's how you do that. I'm gonna take a picture of that. You're, you all should have gotten the same values. Did you? Yes, if you're changing by ones, uh, meaning, you know how my table went zero, one, two, three, four in the X column? That's why I did this X plus one and X because it would increase it by one. Let's say you were looking at it and it was one, 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 .1, 1 1.3. Then all you would do is you change this to X plus 0.1 and the bottom it would be X plus 0.1 minus X. That's all you do differently. If it was counting by tenths or whatever. Good question. And I wanna also do control T here. I'm gonna take snack one more picture. I wanna be able to see all these values across. Yeah, go for it. All right, so now I'm about ready to move on. It says any concavity or inflection points. I wanna remind you of some rules. I'm gonna give you the rules and we're gonna come back and look at that. Highly suggest you write this down, you ready? There are four things here under a rock that I want you to know. Let's see if my pen work. Is my pen back? It's not. All right, one thing. My pen's just not going to be working with me. Okay. There are four things I want you to know about a rock. And here in a second, I'm going to have you follow along with your arm about a rock, which is just as a reminder, the first difference. A rock refers to the first difference, the change in y's divided by the change in x. There are four different possibilities. Okay, now A rock, I told you at the beginning of the year, I want you, when you hear A rock, if you want to associate with anything in your mind, think of slope. So the first thing I want to do is have an A rock that is positive. An A rock that is positive. So if we have an A rock that is positive by symbols, A rock. That is greater than zero. What does that mean if it's greater than zero? Positive. So if your A rock is positive, what does that mean for the graph? So let's yeah. think. So show me a positive A rock with your arm. So remember, you have to go your arm like a slope. Positive A rock should look like this on your arm. What's happening to your graph if your arm is going up like this? Your graph is increasing. We're going to say, F is increasing. If you have a positive A rock, F is, F referring to the function, F is increasing. Okay, what's the opposite situation? Increasing. What if A rock is negative? Write that clear. What if your average rate of change, A rock, is negative? Okay, show me with your arms. What would a negative slope look like? A negative A rock. It should be going down and to the right. What does that mean for the graph if you're going down and to the right? F is decreasing. Good. So maybe I should have wrote that on the side. So the idea here, if you're doing a picture. If you have a positive A rock, that's the idea. The graph is increasing. This time, if you have a decreasing A rock, the graph is, I mean, a negative uh, A rock, your graph is decreasing. Okay, third situation. What if A rock is increasing? So this does not necessarily mean it's positive. It doesn't necessarily mean it's negative. It just means it's increasing. If A rock is increasing, concave up. F is concave up. Very good. And the way I'm going to symbolize this here is I'm going to draw a bunch of little arrows here, a bunch of different slopes like this. So like if it's increasing, so there's a slope, there's a slope, there's a slope. There's a slope. Notice what's happening with my slopes here. 
These keep increasing and it makes it concave up. Last one that you need to know. What if, color have I not used yet? How about orange? What if a rock is decreasing? F is concave down. And I'll do this graph right here. So I'll do a bunch of slopes that are decreasing. Again, with your arm, if your slopes are decreasing, just start with some positive slope and start making it go more and more negative. And it'll kind of draw out your, cur your curve for you. And you'll see, oh, yeah, that's concave down. That's the way to think through that. That's what you need to look for if you're looking at the A rock column. Now, sometimes you're not going to be tested on the A rock column, but they're going to give you the delta A rock column. So now let's do that. One more list here. If it's not A rock, you might be looking at delta A rock. Delta A rock is which difference? The second difference. Good. And I want to put here in parentheses, this is uh, as long as it's not, uh, as long as the second con uh, difference is not equal to zero, not always equal to. Uh, let me put parentheses. As long as not always equal to zero. It can equal zero from time to time, but as long as it's not always equal to zero. There are three scenarios, only three. If delta A rock is positive, what does it mean if your delta A rock is positive? That means your A rock is changing in a positive manner. F is concave up. So what does this mean? That means the A rock is changing positively. Your slope itself is changing positively. It's being changed. It's being changed in the positive direction. So therefore, it would be concave up. What if delta A rock was equal to zero? What would that mean? takers this if it's zero it means it's not concave up it's not concave down it's not constant i'm glad we did this it's an inflection point this as long as it remember the title up here that as long as it's not always equal to zero if it's going from a positive to a negative and you hit zero that's the inflection point. That's when it changes from concave up to concave down or concave down to concave up. So the idea here is something like uh, you were going one way. And then you start going the other way. That point right there that would be an inflection point. You were concave up, now you're concave down, something like that. Uh, wherever you switch, that would be the inflection point. Okay, and so the last situation, A rock is positive, A rock is zero. There's one more I haven't done. What am I missing? A rock is negative. Y'all probably know this by now. The change in A rock, I'm sorry. If the change in A rock is negative, what does that mean? Concave down. F is concave down. F is concave down. So that's just saying your average rate of change is changing to become more and more negative. So whatever your average rate of change was, it's changing and it's becoming more and more negative. It's decreasing.
So that would be concave down. There's your picture for that one. So make sure you know those things. You can even put them on flashcards, working through your parents, through your friends, through your boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. Your wannabe, doesn't matter. Get it down. You'll need to know those seven. Okay. Done with that part. Let's move on. What if I ask you to factor this function? What type of function is this? What would you call that? Quadratic. And you can title it by having three terms. What's a name for a three-term value? Trinomial. Now, when I taught you trinomials with X method, I taught you with rationals first. I said, if it's rational, put your A times C here and your B down here. A, B, C. What is my A if it doesn't show me a number? One. What is one times negative 48? That goes there. Two goes down there. You can look for a GCF first, by the way, to simplify the problem. This one doesn't have a GCF. I would do that first. Now you ask yourself, what are factors of negative 48 that add up to two? Well, what are the factors of negative 48? Plus or minus one times plus or minus 48. There's plus or minus a two times 24. Three and 16. Four and 12, six and eight. Do any of those work? Six and eight, good. It's gonna be some form of six and eight. Now we know we have to have a negative to get to negative 48. So which one would be negative to give me a positive two here when I combine? The six. So what does that mean? You split this one, you split its power. So f of x becomes, you split the power. And so it has an x here and an x in this parenthesis. That's where you, the split comes in. x squared becomes x and x. And now you do a minus six and a plus eight. We have factored the function. Now, why do I want you to know that? You need to be able to graph by hand. So, uh, meaning without the calculator section, you need to know what this means. So if I were gonna draw a quick sketch, x squared is gonna be what type of shape? You already told me. x squared is a parabola. Do we now know any zeros? Six and negative eight, because these factors are liars are zeros. So go to your graph. Before we draw this out, go over, uh, let's call it left eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. That's going to be negative eight. That, we're going to have a zero there. And I'll have another zero at positive six. One, two, three, four, five, six. We'll have a zero there. Actually, let me switch the colors for the zeros. That's a positive six. Okay, some other questions for you. Do you know where the y-intercept would be? Give you a hint, it's the constant that's by itself. You would plug in zeros here to find the y-intercept, negative 48. So the, the math would be, if you wanna know the y-intercept, you'd plug in zero. So f of zero would equal negative 48. So that's the y-intercept. So wherever it hits the y-axis, it'll be negative 48. I'm just going to put a dot on there, and I'm going to say that dot right there is negative 48. Uh, zero comma negative 48. Now, before I connect this problem, last question for you. Where, what x value would the vertex be at? Would the vertex be, like, would the center of this problem be on the y-axis? Good, why not? Because it's gonna be between these two points. Now, how far away is negative eight and positive six on the x-axis? 14 units. So the uh, your vertex will be halfway in between. Very good. Evelyn says the halfway point is negative one. Do y'all agree with her? Okay, so the I'm just going to put a parabola going through. That might be a little bit off, considering where I put my y-axis. So your parabola would go through those points. So again, maybe I should get a little bit closer or something like that. But it would go up through this way. And over this way. Now, why do I point that out? Because on the test, you might need to know 
would this have a uh, any extrema, maximums, minimums? Yeah, where would that minimum be located? Negative one. Now, do we know the negative the value? Negative eight for the is this an absolute or local? That's an absolute minimum. How could you figure out what that y value was if you needed it? Figure out You'd plug in negative one. F negative one would give you the value. Yeah. Do y'all want me to plug it into the original equation or the factored form? Factored. factored. Okay, if we plugged in negative one, it would be negative one minus six times negative one plus eight. What's negative one minus six? Negative seven. That's negative seven. And what's negative one plus eight? What's negative seven times positive seven? <laughs> negative 49. That would be our y-intercept. Uh, not our y-intercept, I'm sorry, our vertex. So that's how you would find all that by hand. If I ask you, while you draw this in, if I ask you to find a limit, what would a limit be telling you? Where it is or where it's going? Where it's going. So what happens as X increases without bound? It's going up. As X increases, Y increases. What happens as X decreases? Y increases. Good. That would be your limits. Okay. Let's move on to the next topic. So I just want to point you out how I got those. What if we had to draw a quick sketch of this? Now, I want you to count it up real quick. And how many total zeros we would say this actually is? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I totally agree. So the end behavior will look more like a parabola or an S curve if it's a ten. The leading term is a uh, the leading term would be x to the tenth. So it'll be a little more, it'll have an end behavior of a uh, parabola. That's right. And a positive parabola because all these x's are positive. Okay. What is the leftmost zero we will have? Are you looking at the positive numbers or the negative numbers? Positive. Which one's going to be the leftmost? Negative eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. There's negative eight. We're going to have a zero there. What's the next leftmost zero? Negative three. Okay. Uh, what about this X that's by itself? What do you do with that one? That's going to be the origin. That's zero, zero right there. Origin. Okay. All right. Let's talk about the ones on the left side. I'm sorry, the right side of the graph. What will we have on the right side of our graph here? Five and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. We need eight and we need one, two, three, four, five marked. Okay, we have zeros at those spots as well. Since it's going to be x to the 10th, the outside, they're going to be like a positive parabola. So I'm going to go up this way. I'm going to go up this way. Now, I know that because the leading term is x to the 10th. It's going to be kind of like a parabola. And by the way, I want to make sure you all know how to find this without the calculator here. Okay, Make sure you know how this works without a calculator. Now, uh, let's talk about what does it mean when this has a cubed on this x plus 8? What does it mean if the, it has multiplicity of 3? it's going to look like an S curve. So I shouldn't have drawn it as much like a straight line. That needs to come through like an S curve. There we go. So I make it like an S curve there. Now, what about at three? How is it going to look there? When you look at this, is it going to make an S curve? It's going to bounce. So what I'm going to do here is draw like a little parabola, a mini parabola. Now, I know that these pieces have to connect. If you're drawing this, I want you to draw down a good bit of ways like this, like I just did here. I'm gonna explain why I did that in a moment.
but just so your drawings, you're not erasing any time. Make sure you give yourself some depth on this first one. Okay, now what's going to happen at this zero? Is it going to go through it or is it going to bounce again? It's going to bounce again. So this one's going to bounce. So it's going to be like a parabola going down as well. Now this time, I don't want you to take it as low. So maybe something like that. Okay, jump over to the zero at five. What can you tell me about that one? It's going to bounce. So again, we're going to do a parabola here. I want you to take this to the exact same depth of the other zero we had, if, as best you can. Now, what about x minus eight? Or positive eight? It's just gonna go straight through. This one, I want you to go to the same depth as this medium, the, the, the smaller depth we had earlier like that on this one. Now I want to add some notes here on why I know it's going to look something like this. I didn't go quite down far enough, it looks like. I think it should have gone a little bit farther, I think. We'll find out in a moment when I use my tools. Here's the notes I want you to have. You can put on here bounce if you need to. This would be a bounce because it had multiplicity too. This would be a bounce if you want to add that bounce. This is just an S curve here. S curve coming through there. What I do want you to mark though, that these would be the absolute extrema. The absolute extrema would be located here and here. These are the absolute extrema. Absolute, to be more specific, minimums. Now, how do I know that? Do you know why I know that? Look at the zeros. How many units apart are these two zeros? How many zeros apart are these? Five. Now, how many zeros are these apart? Five. Because they're both five, and that's the biggest gap, they will have the biggest depth to them. Now, how far away apart are these zeros? Three. So these, why did they go? Let me go back to dotted lines. These would not have the same depth, but they still would have, uh, they would have the same depth as one another, but they would not be as far down as the previous maximums because these zeros are only three apart. Now that, I, frankly, I did not teach you the first time around. And then lo and behold, pulled up that AP exam for y'all on test one, and there was a question that was over that about where would be the absolute extrema. How do we know that these extrema, I'm gonna put here local, oops, these would be local uh, local minimums. Now, how do I know that these two minimums are not as low as the previous two that we looked at? Why would these two not be as low as these two? How far apart is this of the zeros? Local minimums, since the zeros are only, since zeros are how many units apart? Three. Zeros are three units apart. These over here would be absolute minimums since, since why? Zeros are five units apart. Does that make sense to you? I do realize I did not label the maximums. What would you call these maximums here, here, and here? Local, Local maximums. What about this? Is that a maximum? No. no. This would be a point of inflection, but it's not a maximum. So you'd have local maximums. Whoops. Local, three local maximums. And they would all have the same height. We could actually fully label those points because we know their X's and we know their Y values. But you'd have three local maximums. That right there would be called an inflection point. Okay. 
you're what that means is you're changing concavity. You were concave up. This your uh, a rock would be increasing here, and then all of a sudden your a rock's decreasing. So it's changing concavities from concave up to concave down. That's what makes it an inflection point. All right, that's all of that. Tell me about just uh, this is going to be weird. You just call it out here. Tell me about the graph. This is function f. What can you say about function f between these two? When this window that I'm showing you right now, what could you describe about f? It's decreasing. That's one thing you can say. F is decreasing. How else could you describe it? Concave down. No. It is concave down. It might be beginning to change, but it's concave. I'll say concave down. It's decreasing. What else? Negative. What's negative? Okay, so that's not actually F. That would be A rock that's negative. What could you tell me about the function itself? It's actually positive. This graph is positive. Why is it positive here? Oh, it's going up. It's, going up. it's not because it's going up. It's because it's greater than yeah. zero. That's right. It's because it's greater than zero. Okay, I want to change the window in which you're looking at. And I want you to tell me what you could describe about the function F. What if you're now looking from, I should have just moved this side. Here to here. What can you tell me about F now? It's concave down, up. up it's above. concave up. Good. F is concave up. What else could you say about F? Is it positive? Is it negative? Yes. Is it a little bit of both? It's a little bit of both. So we want to actually say it's positive. We want to say it's negative. This part's positive. This part's negative. But we could say it's concave yeah. up. Okay. What could you tell me between here and there f is increasing i just want to make sure you know the word that would be f is increasing anything else that's consistently true always there okay what about here and here so i didn't give you much time it's positive what else and it's concave down positive concave down uh be smart this time i'll move this part what would you say here concave up and and it's negative. Okay, what if I looked from here to here? Uh, it's still concave up technically because the A rock is always increasing. So it's concave up, but you could also say it's increasing. You could also say it's negative. Okay, so that was just a little game to make sure you understand the difference in vocabulary. Any questions over vocabulary there? Okay, moving on. I think I have two more slides, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, two, two more. Describe the domain asymptotes, holes, intercepts for this equation. For rationals, there are really just five things you can look at. What is it with rationals you're not allowed to divide by? Zero. So right now, I can find all the values that are outside the domain. A domain, will you assume it's all reals unless it is either dividing a square, like an even root, or a logarithm. Here, what are you not allowed to divide by? You just told me. Tell me again. So our domain it will be x cannot equal... What can it not equal right there? Uh, right here. Not zero. Zero plus two is fine. Negative two. X cannot be negative two. What about here? Positive five and here? Positive three. But it could be all other real values. X could be all other reals. It just could not be those. Okay. Now, if you want to know about asymptotes versus holes, you look at the things cancel out, specifically vertical asymptotes versus holes. So now I want to transition to, let's talk vertical asymptotes. Let's talk holes. So do you see any factors that cancel? I have an x plus two and one of those x plus twos. I also have... A minus five and a minus five. Now, because this completely canceled, we will have a hole at x equals five. We will have some hole when x is five. We will not have it, though, at x plus two. Even though that factor canceled there, I still have one remaining in the denominator. So this is actually going to become a vertical asymptote. A vertical asymptote will trump a hole, meaning this looks like it should have one of each, a vertical asymptote and a hole because it canceled one. Vertical asymptote takes, uh, takes over. So we'll have a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 2. And this does not cancel. It'll be a vertical asymptote at x equals 
positive three. As for the hole, what you do is you plug in five. Let me see if I can move this over, will it? Let me slide it. Perfect, I'm gonna slide this over. So for the hole, what you do is you plug in that value five. So I'm gonna plug in five. In the numerator, it'll be five plus three. And the denominator, it'll be five plus two times five minus three. So I'm going from, we knew is that x equals five. I plugged in five to the equation and now we'll simplify. The whole would be five comma. So I've just plugged in five here, here, here. That's what I've done. What's five plus three? What's five plus two? Seven. Oh, wait, I didn't finish this off right. Y'all didn't correct me. I should have put five minus three. What in the world did I write? Five minus three. No wonder you were looking weird at me. There we go. Uh, what's five plus two? Seven. What's five minus three? Seven times two is... Can we simplify that? Four over seven. So the value would be five comma four over seven. That's our whole. So we've done domain. We did whole. Talk to me about the asymptote. Uh, horizontal, I mean, sorry. Third thing. Do we have a horizontal asymptote or will it be slanted? How many powers do I have in the numerator? One, how many powers of X do I have? I'm doing it right now, my leading term. And how many powers of X do I have my denominator? Two. Is this, so I have one left over, I have two here. Is it the power bigger on the top? Is it bigger on the bottom or the X one is the same? Bigger or worse than top. My power is bigger on the bottom. The rule was Bobo. What did Bobo stand for? Bigger on bottom? Y equals zero. Yep. Shouldn't matter. She get the same answer. So we had one X left over, two X's left over in the denominator. So it's X over X squared. It's bigger on bottom. That's Y equals zero. What if it's bigger on top? That was bottom. What did the N stand for? There's no horizontal asymptote. It'll be slanted. And that the exponents are the same? It's DC, which means divide your coefficients. Okay, uh, what's left over here? The y-intercept. The y-intercept occurs when you plug in zero, meaning you ignore anything that has an x. If you ignore anything that has an x, what's the only number on the numerator? Three. It will be three over two times negative three which equals three over, what's two times negative three? Negative six. negative six. And three divided by negative six is the same thing as negative one half. Okay, and finally, any asymptote and intercepts. I did uh, y-intercepts, what's the only thing left over? This is where you solve the numerator. The only thing left to solve is this one here. What would x equal there? x would equal negative three, which you could write that as a point as uh, negative three comma zero. I should have done that here as well. The y-intercept you could do as zero comma negative one half. Have a horizontal asymptote of zero. We do, right here. Horizontal asymptote, y equals zero. Ah, it can. So the asymptote just means your, your ends of the graph, horizontal will approach it. You actually will have, I'll graph this for you and show you. Uh, X plus three, that's a great question. Um, I'm gonna grab, it's X plus three over, what was left over? X plus two, I think, times X minus three. Notice it hits at negative three. And then if you zoom out, you see how it gets real flat on zero? It still approaches zero. Let me go big. It still has a y uh, a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. You see how those graphs approach each other? 
But if you zoom in, you'll see it does actually have an X intercept. So that can happen, yeah. So you'll see graphs later in the year that look like this maybe, one divided by X times sine X. And so this one, let me turn these off. If you look to the right, this is considered a horizontal asymptote too. And you see how it's hitting the X axis over and over and over because it's a wave, but it's a very unique graph. What's happening is that wave is just getting smaller and smaller. It's called oscillating, but it's going to get closer and closer. Yeah, you'll hit the x-axis. That can happen. What you can't do is hit a vertical asymptote. You can never hit a vertical asymptote. Uh, I think Miss Mueller calls it being friend zoned. Have you heard her say that before? And you go, Heather, like you want to get close and you try to get close, but you never get to touch. That's what she calls it. Okay, y'all didn't like that. All right, well, blame, it on, blame that joke on her. Last one. Given this factor. What are the roots for this equation? How could you figure out, no calculator, what the other roots are here? Can I X method this right now? What could we do? Synthetic division. All right. So start me off, Destiny. If the factor is X plus four, what is my zero? If your factor is X plus four, what is your zero? That's right. First step. State what x equals. x equals negative 4. Second step, make sure you're not missing any powers. Are we missing any powers here? 3, 2, 1, none. Got them. So I'm positive 4, positive 20, positive 14, negative 8. Draw your line. What's step 3? We called it mama, the four drops. And what does that M stand for? Multiply, what's four times negative four? 20 minus 16 is four good. That's a positive. So what's positive four times negative four? Negative 16, so positive 14 minus 16. Negative two times negative four? Positive 8. What's negative 8 plus 8? Now, should we have gotten 0 yes. as a remainder? Absolutely, because if this is going to be a factor, that means x equals negative 4 is a 0 because the remainder is 0. And it also means that x plus 4 is a factor. So how could we completely factor the rest? If this was x cubed, what is this now? x squared, and this is a x. Now there is a GCF there. I'm gonna pretend like you don't see the GCF. And I'm gonna show you a way, I'm gonna try to blow your minds here, how we can do x method. Well, y'all don't know the problem yet. Let's factor this with x method. Let's pretend you don't, I didn't say what I just said. Draw your x. What goes on the top of the x? A times C, so y'all are saying negative eight? I agree. What goes on the bottom of the X? Four. What are factors of negative eight that add up to four? What are the factors of negative eight? Plus or minus one times eight and two times four. Which one can come on and give you four? Neither, which means this is not rational. There's a way of doing it, though, and I'm going to try to blow your minds here as quick as you can. Here's what you do first. You take your B, you divide it by 2. What's our B divided by 2? Two? 2. That goes in each side. Put 2, and it's going to be a plus a square root, and 2 minus a square root. So you take your B, you divide it by 2, and then you do plus or minus a square root on each side. of uh, x method. I'll do on each side of x method. So how do we get this to? You b, you just cut it in half, and it'll be a plus and a minus the square root. Those are always going to come in pairs. Now, what you do is you're going to solve, solve b over 2 squared plus some number, I'm going to do a question mark, plus some number equals, 
A times C. So practically, B over two is what number in our problem? Two. two. What that means is if I were to multiply this, yeah, I would have two times two, which is four. I would have two times a negative square root and then a positive square root times the two as well, which would cancel. But then I'd be left with a negative, uh, I need to put a minus there, a positive square root times a negative square root. And the square roots would cancel out and you'd be left with whatever goes inside. That's where this comes in. Change that to a negative. I gave you the bad step. That's a negative there. So what does it mean practically? When you write this, all you need to think through is what is two times two? Plus some number we're going to put inside our square root, which we don't know yet. Four plus, not plus, sorry, minus, did it twice. Four minus some number is going to give us negative eight. And now we're going to solve for the question mark to figure out what goes inside of there. So how do I solve for my question mark? Well, I add a question mark to both sides. And I'm going to add eight to both sides. So the question mark's gone over here. What's four plus eight? 12. This goes away. The only thing left over is 12. That 12 goes inside the square root. Those are our factors. Now there is a third step that I will call reduce square root if necessary. Reduce square root. And we can put that in parentheses if necessary. So can I simplify the square root of 12? Answer is yes. There's a lot of ways of doing this. I'm just going to be quick. You could know, you could break it down into factors and say, well, square root of 12 is the same thing as two. Two goes into 12 how many times? Six. And I can break down six into two times three. You could break, you could prime factorization it and then say oh wait a minute these are a pair and if it's a pair that square root of two times square root of two is the square root of four and i will have a square root of four what is the square root of four two and that's a way of simplifying it a lot of students just look at it this way if you have a pair that pair goes outside the square or outside the root so you see how i have a pair of twos so i just put that on the outside they skip this step and then the sing, since the three is a single, it stays inside. It's two squared to three. So what does that mean for my factors? I can now finish this problem. I would break this all apart right here. I would take this A term. And I would split its power. So longest pro problem, making it longer. It's now going to be 4x. I split, the, I split the power. 4x plus 2 plus, instead of square root of 12, I'm going to say 2 squared to 3 times 4x plus 2 minus 2 square root of 3. Those are the factors there. Since that a was a factor of 4, I need to divide out by a factor of 4 or factors of 4. What can I divide the front parentheses by? 2. What can I divide the back parentheses by? Perfect. That's what I needed to be able to divide out of four. Now I am a two here, a two there. And so that means my last factors would be two X plus one plus square root of three times two X plus one minus square root of three. I know some of you are like, oh my gosh, this is impossible. I am intentionally giving you a hard one, intentionally. Okay, there's your factors. Remember this factor from earlier? was x plus four. So there's the whole factorization. I'm sorry, let me raise that. There's the entire factors, which would tell us our zeros would be x equals negative four. And in here, you make all these liars. So it'd be a negative one plus and minus the square root of three. Since there's a two in front on both of those, you'd have to divide it by two. There are your zeros. Unbelievable. A lot of work. But now you have it in your notes.
Be mind blown. If you turn on the GCF, it still wouldn't do X-Men. X-Men wouldn't work. So that's a good thought. You could have done quadratic formula. But I brought that up the other day, and y'all didn't remember that either. So I gave you about as hard a problem as you can get right there. But it's good for you. All right, now you have a delta map. You want to open that up? 